study. My name is David Baptiste from Behold the Lamb Ministries International, where we're changing lives one life at a time. Tonight, I want to talk to you about whose report will you believe? Whose report will you believe? Uh, that's a good question. A lot of times we report, we believe the report of the doctor. We believe the report of the finance agencies. We need to believe his report. So tonight we want to talk about whose report will you believe? We're going into the book of Genesis, the 17th chapter. We're starting at the first verse, but let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of your holy word. Open the eyes of our understanding that we may know what is the hope of your calling, what's the exceeding greatness of your power to us who believe. We'll be careful to give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. Hide me behind the cross so only you can be seen. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. And all the believers say amen. 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 Genesis 17 and 1. He said, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I'm almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Walk circumspectly. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be the father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I've made you the father of many nations. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come out of you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, your descendants after you, in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan have an everlasting possession. I will be there, go. Now, God says, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. Canaan was a land that flowed with milk and with honey. And God says, I'm going to give you the land. So my thing is, God told them he was going to give them the land. He told them all about Canaan. He told them what Canaan was like. He told them the people that were there. And he told them how he was going to give them the victory. And whenever God gives us all those details, all we got to do is possess the land. <clears throat> if God gave you a piece of property and he told you, listen, this, this, this address, 1905 Louisa Street, is your house. And he gave it to you. All you have to do is go down there and possess what God has given you. And that's exactly how it works. Now, the thing about it is when you get down there, they got a big dog in the yard. My question is, are you going to allow the dog to stop you from possessing the house? I don't know about you, but I'm not going to let some dog stop me from possessing what God has given me. I'm going to have to figure out how to get the dog out the yard or get the dog off the property. But some kind of way the dog got to go. Some kind of way. And I know a lot of y'all would not get the house because of the dog. And that's saying, if you let a dog stop you from possessing, God has something for you. And that's exactly what we do. We do when we allow the devil to stop us from possessing what God has given us. I'm just giving you an analogy. That the dog in the yard, a bad dog. I'm going to figure out a way to get the dog to come behind some meat. I'm going to get him to get out the gate. I'm going to get him out the gate and I'm going to get in the gate. Some kind of way I'm going to get him out my property. Because I want what God has given me. I don't know about you, but I'm going to do whatever I got to do to get that house and get that dog off that property. It's the same thing with the things of God. God will give us the promises of God, but we have to believe his report. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because we're going to study the word. We're going to find out 
that even though God told them how Canaan was, how it was a land flowing with milk and honey, uh, that the vegetation and the fruit was, I mean, huge. He told them the people that were there and how he was going to deal with them and evict them. They still had questions about his integrity. Because when, when it was time for them to go into the land, they asked, could they go and spy the land out? That was not God's idea. That was their idea. And, and so that tells me the questions his, his integrity. Let me tell you something. If God tell you there's cheese on the moon, just bring your crackers. You don't have to question it. When God says something, it's coming to pass. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, it's going to happen. All we got to do is believe. See, our problem is we don't know how to believe God. You know, the word believe means to trust in, to rely on, to adhere to, and to obey. See, we got one or two of them, but we don't have them all. You've got to have them all in place. I said to trust in, to rely on, to adhere to, or to obey, and to do. See, that, that's, that means belief. So when you say you believe and you don't act on it, you really don't believe. And, and faith is the currency of heaven. So when you believe God, you got to act on what you believe. If, if you believe God said you're well, then stop acting like you're here. Praise God. Don't walk by how you feel. Walk by faith. Even if you're still limping, keep on walking. Praise God. You got to do something. I told God I did. I prayed for him. You know, and he, he said he had the sciatic kicking in on it. I said, the sciatic got to go. Don't you know everything is subject to the name of Jesus? I said, everything is subject to the name of Jesus. Now, this is the thing. Once I prayed for him, I said, do something you couldn't do. See, that's where faith kicks in. Because if you really believe that the prayer worked, you act on your faith. And, 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 and the devil knows that a lot of times he'll make us walk according to what we see or what we hear or how we feel and not by what we believe. You got to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. So I want you to go over with me to the book of Deuteronomy, the first chapter. So we can watch how Israel operated. And it's sad because... The people of God, Israel, did not go into the promised land. Their children did, but they didn't. And it was only because they refused to believe his report. That's my question to you tonight. Whose report will you believe? The word of God says he'll take you out of darkness and translate you into his marvelous light. It says he'll make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. That he'll put favor on your life. That everywhere you go, doors are open. Things will shift to accommodate you. You got to believe that. And not only that, you got to be in communion with Almighty God. See, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you get in the word, the more faith comes. And, and, and our problem is we start looking at our situation and our circumstance. And, and when we consider the circumstance, we, we look at the circumstance instead of looking at our God. And so the more you look at your problem, the bigger your problem gets. But the more you look at your God, the bigger your God gets. You could always tell what you've been looking at based on your circumstance and your situation. If your situation is bigger than your God, you've been looking at the wrong thing. Praise God. You, you got to have the right perspective. You, you got to be able to look at things from heaven to earth, not from earth to heaven. You, you got to see it the way God sees it. Because if you can't see it before you see it, you ain't never going to see it. You know, faith is, is the things we hope for, evidence of things we can't see. You got to see it before you see it or you'll never see it. Let's go over to Deuteronomy 1. And I think it's 18 I want to read to you guys. Deuteronomy 1 and 18. Okay. I'm going to start at 19. It says, so we departed from Horeb and went through all the great and terrible wilderness, which 
you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites. As the Lord God has commanded us, then we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God has given us. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you go and possess it. See, it's already their land. If God gave it to you, it's yours already. Do you know everything belongs to the Lord? The cattle on the thousand hills is the Lord. Everything he's got. God can give you something that somebody else is holding down right now. Do you know that? That God can give you something that somebody else has ownership of, but it ain't theirs. It's God's because he owns everything. And he could give it to you without them knowing. And then God could deal with them about giving it to you, but he already gave it to you. Because that's who he is. He can do whatever he wants. Now, he already told them that this land was theirs. All they had to do was go and possess it. And, and as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you, do not fear or be discouraged. And every one of you came near to me and said, let us send men before us and let them search out the land. So what is that telling me? That's telling me that they questioned his integrity. And they questioned God's faithfulness. Because he already gave them the land. So if he gave it to them, why? If, if he gave it to them and he told them everything about the land and how it was flowing with milk and honey, why did they have to see what he already said was that? You know why? Because they were full of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Because listen, if God already told you what it was like, then why I got to go see it for myself? Mm -hmm. He already told me it was the way it was. But see, they didn't believe God. And so they wanted to go and see for themselves. And that's what they say. They said they wanted to go and let us send some men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go and the cities in which we should come. So that was their good idea. I think it was a bad idea, but to them, they thought it made sense. And, and verse 23 said, then plan, please, we will. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe, departed and went up to the mountains and came to the valley of his skull, spied it out. Uh, they also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought back a word to us saying, it's good land, which the Lord our God has given us. Nevertheless, <laughs> that's something. Remember, nevertheless, never settle for less. I said, never settle for less. Don't, don't take the, 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 the bottom of the barrel. Take it from the top, but don't take it at all. He said, nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebel against the command of the Lord your God, and you complained in your tents. And he said, because the Lord hates us, he's brought us out of the land to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. And that's sad. That God has given them a promise that he will give them the land. He promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He promised all of Abraham's lineage that he will give them this land, the land that flows in, with milk and honey. And they were constantly thinking that God was going to bring them somewhere and do them something wrong. And you know, a lot of people view God like that, that God's going to punish me, you know, for what I've done. God is a merciful God. He's a forgiving God. And so we got to know the God of mercy. The Bible said his mercy is new every morning. Some people can't get past the condemnation of their past. They, they can't get past the guilt of their past. Some of the decisions they've made, they're constantly living under a judgment, a sentence of judgment, when God has already paid, forgave them. And listen, he says he'll take your sin and throw it as far as the east from the west. Throw it in the lake of forgetfulness, never to remember it again. Well, why is it constantly coming up in your mind? You know why? Because that's the devil. He'll always remind you of your past to keep you from moving into your future. These guys will stuck on the fact that they rebelled and they couldn't see no good coming out of what God was trying to do in their life. 
I'm trying to get you to see that God has good things for you in store for you. He says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for good and not for evil. To give you a hope and an expected end. I know the plans I have. You know why you don't know the plans he has for you? Because you don't read the plan. <laughs> you need to read the book. The promises of God are yes and amen. These guys were complaining and murmuring about something God had already given them. All they really needed to do was exercise their faith and go and possess the land that God gave them. But they found every reason not to. Okay, so they decide, well, we don't trust God's faithfulness, so we want to go and see for ourselves. That's how some of us are. God will tell you something, but you got to see it for yourself. You're like Tony, Dalton Tony, see? If I could put my hand in your side, he had to see, he had to physically see it for himself, he had to feel it. And, and, and Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. I don't have to see it to believe. If he said it, I believe it. That settles it. We need to take him at his word and believe. But you know, they would have problems with that. So they need to question God's faithfulness. And God allowed them to go in and send spies. But then he got really mad with them after they conducted themselves like they did. Let me show you what they did. In 30, 28, verse 28 says, where can we go up? Our brothers have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And moreover, they are giants there. And then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord, your God, who goes before you, he will fight for you. According to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carried his son in all the ways that you went until you came to this place. So God said, I've done so much for you. Why don't you just believe? But they couldn't. So verse 34 said, the Lord heard the sounds of the words and was angry. And listen at this. And he took an oath saying, surely not one of these men of evil generations shall see the good land of which I swore to give their fall. God got frustrated. He said, they, they are not going in. I'm, I'm, and guess what? You know what? They got prepared to go in. And they said, Lord, we're going to go in and possess the land. He said, no, don't go. Because I'm not going with you. Oh, my God. See what unbelief will do? Unbelief will cancel God's plan for your life. When they decided to go, God said, don't go now. It's too late. I'm not going with you. Isn't that something? Man, that got to be heartbreaking. But God to say, listen, your children going to go in and possess the land, but you, you are not going in. Your generation is not going in. We know they died in the wilderness. But they died because they refused to believe. How many of you out there are going to die because you refuse to believe? The book of Isaiah said, whose report will you believe? Let me tell you something. I don't care what the doctor says. Jesus has the final say so. He has the final authority. And so you can't walk by what the doctor says. You're going to have to walk by what you believe. Your faith is going to have to supersede anything you've heard the doctor say. The doctor can only go so far. And when he goes as far as he can go, then the Lord Jesus Christ will kick in. But you're going to have to have the faith to believe that what he says will come to pass. He said he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. And by his stripes, you were healed. Not all healed. You were healed. 2,000 years ago, he paid for your sickness, paid for your sin, paid for your mental illness. Pay for everything you're struggling with. And let me tell you something. I go to Winn-Dixie right now and pay for groceries. Come home, give you the receipt. With it paid in full. All you got to do is go to Winn-Dixie and tell them you came to pick up the groceries 
that I bought you. You ain't going to win Dixie and pay for the groceries all over again because they already paid for. It. So why would you be paying for something that has already been paid for? Why would you carry sickness when it's already been paid for? Why, why, why would you carry something that you don't have to carry anymore? He already carried it to the cross and paid it in full. Everything you struggle with today has already been paid for. You know what? Our problem is we're lazy. We, we don't want to get in the word so that the word can get in us. We don't want to strengthen ourselves so we can have something to fight the enemy with. See, you're going to have to fight him with the soul of the spirit, which is the word of God. You got to get the word in your mouth and in your heart. That's the problem. The problem is we are lazy Christians. We don't want to spend time in his presence. No, feed me. Feed me, pastor. Just open my mouth and just put it in me. No, you need to do the work. Put the work in. It's like my son said. When you get up in the morning, you just punch in. Praise God. Go to work. <laughs> You punched in on heaven's clock. Now go to work. See, some of us don't want work. It's like people I work with on a job. Most of them show up and they don't want to do nothing. They just want to check. So everybody dug and hide to do as less as possible. Isn't that sad? But that's just reality. That's who people are. Well, that's the, in, the, in, the, in the kingdom, the people do the same thing. They want God to provide everything. They want him to be a provider. They want to be a healer. They want to be everything, but they don't want to do nothing. No reciprocity. Listen, you're going to receive on the same level you get. If you ain't receiving that, because you ain't giving nothing. Okay, you said you work for God? Then let me ask you, what you did this week? How many people you touched? How many people you went to see about? How many people you laid hands on? How many people you gave something to? You ain't did nothing, but you want to hold. You ain't going to get no check. I'm going to tell you now. When you get your check, it's going to say, boy. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I got some brothers work for me. And look, a lot of times we go out and they try to do as less as possible. Every time you turn around when I'm sitting down smoking, I said, let me tell you, when you get your check, you see a little man with a cigarette, you know who that is. <laughs> That's you sitting on the clock, praise God. And I ain't paying you to sit on the clock. So every time you sit down, you're going to see a little man sitting on your check, praise God. Because I'm not paying you to sit down. I'm paying you to work. Let me tell you something. God wants to do a mighty work in our lives. There's nothing God won't do. See, if you want to do ministry, if you want to do media, whatever you want to do, God will give you what you need to do that. And he'll put people in your life to finance your vision. So stop trying to measure your bank account based on the vision God gave you. No, measure your vision based on his bank account. Because guess what? In his bank account, there's no limit. Hallelujah. Praise God. No limit. He's the El Shaddai, the all sufficient God. He's the God who's more than enough. He's not just enough. He's more than enough. Praise God. So you ought to not lack anything. See, when you're working for God, I promise you, the best benefits in the world are working for the king. You can't get better benefits. Anything you need is at your access. See, in the kingdom, you don't need ownership. You need stewardship. I don't need to own it. I just need to be able to access it when I need it. How would you like to have a credit card that you could access anytime you need it? Praise God. When you got credit with God, you don't need finances. God will open doors no man can close. Do you, let me tell you something. People got to understand all these teachings in the Bible is for us. It's for our learning. So we can understand how it works. Look, let's go over the 13th chapter of Numbers. <clears throat> Numbers 13. We're going we're gonna to see right where, where it meets, the rubber meets the road. <clears throat> Numbers 13, verse 17. It said, Moses sent the spies to the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way into the south. Go up to the mountains and see what the land is like. Now, remember, God had already told them what Canaan was like. But since they went to Moses and told him they wanted to send some spies, Moses said, okay, you want to see for yourself? Since you can't see it before you see it, you're never going to see it. Go see it for yourself. Oh, you think, well, once they saw it, 
it would have given the confidence to go and possess the land. That's what you would have thought. But check this out. They went out to see the land, whether the people would dwell with strong or weak, whether there were few or many, whether the land they dwell in was good or bad, whether the cities they inhabited were like camps or strongholds, whether the land was rich or poor, whether there were forests or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land now. The time was a season for first ripe grapes. So it was time for grapes. So they went up and they spied out the land of the wilderness in Zin, as far as Roho, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south, came to Hebron. Ahimah, Shishan, Tamai, the descendants of Anax were there, the giants. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon and Jeet. And then he came to the valley of Esau, and there they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they carried it between two of them on a pole. Could you imagine that? You can imagine how big those grapes were. It took two of them to carry one cluster of grapes. So you're talking about a land flowing with milk and honey. They also brought some of the pomegranates and the figs. And a place was called the Valley of a Skull because of the clusters which the men of Israel cut down. They returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back the word to them, to all the congregation, showed them the fruit of the land, and they told them, they said, we went up to the land where you sent us. It's true, Lord. It flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw giants in the land. The Melchites dwell in the land. The Hittites, Je now listen to me. God told them who was in the land before they went there. He told them all about Canaan. He told them who was there, and he told them how he was going to get rid of them. They went down there to see what God said was true and found the people that God told them was there. But he also told them he was going to deal with them. But guess what? Listen at this. They, they said they got giants in the land. The Amalites are there. The Amalekites are there. The Hittites, the Jezebites, the Amorites. And they're all in the mountain. The Canaanites dwell in the sea along the banks of the Jordan. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. They had 12 spies, 12 pastors, two that believed God and the other 10 were full of unbelief. And they came back with an evil report. They say everything you say is true, but, see, that's our problem, but, I, I, everything you say was true, but there's giants in the land. See, the two had courage and confidence that God would do what he promised, but the 10, all they saw was danger and defeat. See, it's according to what you see. You got to stop walking by what you see and walk by what you believe. Whose report will you believe? See, Joshua and Caleb, they were ready to possess the land. They were ready. Joshua's name means the Lord saves, and Caleb means wholehearted. Praise God. It just took two of them to go down there, and, and that was the only two that really inherited. All the rest of them died in the wilderness, but the children came into the inheritance. But it's because they died, they did not believe. They, want, they say, look, we, we see everything that's good, but, but there's giants in the land. So their eyes were on the wrong thing. They were focused on the giants instead of focusing on their God. Mm -hmm. They were watching what God said was there. God told them they were there, but he also told them that he would deal with them. But they didn't trust God. They didn't believe God enough to be able to go in and possess the land. Joshua and Caleb were ready. They said, we're more than able to take the land. So what they saw as a defeat, Joshua and them saw as a victory. Joshua and them saw 
the giants in the land as lunch. We're eating for lunch. But the other people saw them as a threat. And they were afraid and they feared for their lives and they refused to go in and possess the very land that God gave them. See, attitude determines your altitude. With the wrong attitude, you ain't going nowhere. I can tell you that now. You got to have the right attitude. The attitude will determine your altitude. You know, that's the reason why the lion is so victorious in the jungle, because he got an attitude. He ain't the biggest animal in the jungle. He ain't the strongest animal in the jungle. He ain't the meanest animal in the jungle. But boy, I tell you what, when he roared, he put fear in everybody. Oh. <laughs> That's why Jesus is called the lion of the trial of Judah. Man, let me tell you something. We, was out, <clears throat> we went to Minnesota to this man who was possessed with a devil. I'll never forget this. In my young walk with the Lord, it was about four or five of us. We had four of us and the white guy, James, that was with us. And the guy was possessed. And man, he was spitting all kind of threats out, talking in two or three different languages. And we were just dealing with it based on our experience. We didn't have that much experience, but we had a lot of faith. We was in that, dealing with that demon. And I never forget this. James fell on his knees and began to roar like a lion. And let me tell you that demon left. That man got delivered. I ain't never seen nothing like that before. That did, I mean, yeah. got out of there. The demon just took out of there. But the line, see, now I don't know what you saw. See, sometimes God will show, we see one thing, but they saw something else. Obviously, he saw something that he was afraid of. That demon got out of there. And let me tell you something, that dude was roaring like a lion. I mean, a human, but he sounded like a lion. And obviously, I told after it was all over, I said, Shoot, he must have saw the lion of the tribe of Judah. Because he got out of there. That boy got free that night. I said that to say this. The lion, like I said, he's not the strongest. He's not the biggest. You know, elephant way bigger than a lion. But everything is scared of that lion. You know why? Because the lion has an attitude. You already know sometimes you meet people with attitude. You ain't seen people, look, I ain't seen people got a demon, but they still got attitude. They come up the street and you can tell this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem. Most people see these kind of people cross the street. You see, I got attitude too. I ain't crossing. He better cross. Or we're going to have a problem. You know what I'm saying? I'm telling you right now, I ain't crossing the street. So, if, you know, if, it, if it's got room for just me and him, somebody's going to move out the way because I ain't bothered. Praise God. I got an attitude too. My attitude comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. I ain't bothering to none of them demons. They're going to get out of my way. I remember I was going up the street and this dude was coming up the street swinging and black. And you know, my first thought said, let me cross the street before I had to put my hands on it. You know what I mean? Because I'm going to lay hands on it. I was going to lay hands on it. It wasn't the kind of hand that you do. But let me tell you, when I got close to it, he shot, he shot me on the street. And look, I said to myself, Alan, because my thought was, oh, I'm gonna have to deal with this dude. <laughs> but right before we got head up, he shot across the street. And I said to myself, that's what you better do. You get across that street. <laughs> boy, I try to get my kicked out, little people. Them demons, boy, they all over the place. But listen, attitude determines your altitude. Now let me say this. They saw the same thing. They experienced the same thing. The only difference was their perspective. One saw the giants, the other one saw the victory. See, faith always sees opportunity, but fear always sees obstacles. You can always tell where you are. You either see obstacles or you see opportunity. Stop looking at obstacles and start looking at opportunities. God has opened many doors for us. But we're so busy looking at the things around us, we can't walk in. Let me give you a perfect example. You want to see faith in action? Go with me to Matthew, the eighth chapter. 
this is what God called the believers to be like. Matthew, and this, this guy wasn't even a, a believer. He was a Roman centurion. Mm -hmm. Matthew 8. I want you to see this because this is how the believers ought to live. Listen, faith comes by how? Yeah. Hearing. And hearing and hearing by the word of God. How does fear come? By hearing and hearing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. see, it's according to what you've been listening to. If you keep giving your ears to fear, fear will take over and paralyze you. And you won't be able to do nothing for God. But faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why it's important that you hear the word every chance you get. You ought to knock the doors down on Sunday morning. Wednesday night, you ought to be on the first one on Zoom to hear a word from heaven. Listen to this. Matthew 8 and 5, it said, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, there was a centurion who came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered, said, Lord, I'm not even worthy that you should come to my roof or under my roof, but speak the word only in my servant will be here. See, you don't even have to come. I know one thing. If you speak the word, my servant will be healed. See, that's the faith I'm talking about. You know, that's real faith. That you don't even have to come lay hands on him. Just speak the word. Because I know your word carries a thorn. And listen at this. This is what really got me. He said, just speak the word. But I also am a man under authority and having soldiers under me. And I say to one go, and he goes. And to another come, and he comes. And I say to one do this, and he does it. Now I'm in authority over mankind. I've got natural authority. But Lord, you got spiritual authority. You command spirits. And if you say leave, they got to leave. And you don't have to come to my house. Just speak the word. And my servant will be healed. You know, Jesus said, I ain't seen faith like this, no, not in all Israel. You don't have to come to the house. If you say it, I believe it. That settles it. Listen to this. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. He said to those who followed, and surely I said to you, I have not found great faith like this in all Israel. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done to you. And his servant was healed the same hour. Praise God. See, that's what I'm talking about. When you believe God, you know you, you, you got what you asked him for before you even get back to the house. It says he was healed the same hour. You know why? Because Jesus said, be it unto thee according to your faith. Remember, faith is the currency of heaven. Faith is all you need to access God's promise. Faith is all you need to receive from God. You can't, listen, you can't buy a healing with money. People who got money die because they don't know the God we serve. All you need is faith in God. What I love about the Lord is when you trust him, when you walk by faith, God will show up and show out. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Chronicles 16 and 9 that God's eyes go to and fro throughout the earth, searching for somebody who he can show mm -hmm. himself strong mm -hmm. on their behalf. Yeah. You know what that means? Yep. That God's looking to show off. I told him, no, look no further. <laughs> show off on me. <laughs> Show off on me. Give me the house. 
on a thousand hills that I ain't have to pay a dime for. Give me the Bentley that I can drive without paying a note, praise God. I'm here, show off on me. Now, I don't need a Bentley, but if God gave me one, I'm sure going to drive in Jesus' name. <laughs> praise God. Let me tell you something. My son had gotten into a little trouble. And at the time he got in trouble, they had just passed the law. And the law said that anybody with drugs and a, a firearm has to go to jail for five years. That's a must. So when he caught the charge, I began to tell God that, listen, I got collateral in heaven. I've kept so many young men and mothers, sons out of jail till I know God ain't allowing my son to go to jail. See, I refuse to accept that as the final say. Now, my lawyer, his lawyer, we had a lawyer, and the lawyer said, look, I don't know what you mean, Pastor, but I'm telling you, we fighting a losing battle. I said, no, 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 no. You fight the losing battle. I don't fight the same battle you fight. Because I fight my battle on my knees. And I'm telling you that my son ain't going to do a day in jail. So, boy, he said, you talk a mean game. I said, I mean what I say. I said, I got collateral in hell. I could tell you at least 10 or 15 young men that I kept from going to prison. My son ain't going to jail. So we went through the motions. We went to about two or three court dates. And I said, listen, you just do your job. I said, things are going to shift to accommodate me, praise God. Uh, right before they were going to go to trial, you know, I didn't want to go to trial. I said, but I said, if I have to go to court, I'm going to the courts of heaven first. Praise God. And boy, we got me and my wife got to praying and seeking God because I said, my son ain't going to jail. I, I kept all these young men from going to jail. And two days before we went to court, the attorney called me. And he said, the DA wants to talk. I said, well, go ahead and talk. Do your job. And he said, but I thought about something. He said, if we could get them to split the charge, then it won't be a gun and a firearm. There'll be drugs and a firearm be separate charges. If we can give him split charges, then he won't have to go to jail for his job. I said, well, daddy, I knew there had to be a way. Where there's a way, God's going to make a way out of no way. So now, they went to the table, they came back, said, we're going to break the charges, we're going to separate the two charges, and he ain't going to jail. He, he going to have to go to uh, a, a drug program, but he ain't gonna serve a day in jail. I say, praise God. Don't tell me what God's gonna do. You know what that happened with that? You go to the bank sometimes. I go to the bank sometimes with checks. And when I put the checks in, the lady, she calls for the other lady. She says, I need an override. <laughs> I say, glory to God. Override. <laughs> but God, see, I, I don't care what the, the lawyer said. He said, look, he, the attorney told me, he said, no matter what, he go to jail. I, I said, the devil is alive. But God, God going to make a way out of no way. That's what he does. And sure enough, my son didn't do not one day in jail. Hallelujah. Because God showed up and showed up. Amen. Don't tell me what God can't do. Let me tell you something. We, me and my wife, when we bought this house, we had, our credit was shot. But go. <laughs> Let me tell you, the man wanted us to have the house so bad. The man said, I'm not selling the house to nobody but you. Not only that, my sister-in-law lived right next to me. We walked around this house. I said, this is our house. We claimed this house. When everything said no, God said yeah. But you know what? We were in faith. We were believing God. And we didn't care what it looked like. See, I didn't, I didn't go by what the credit report said. I didn't go by any of that. I went by what God said. I believed his report. I, I didn't trust in the credit report. I believed in God's report. Whose report are you going to believe? 
let me tell you something. Not only did the man pay for the clothes, he gave us money and did everything he could to put us in his house to the glory of God. Don't tell me what God won't do. Yes, listen, it was, I think I said, Lord, after I got the house, I said, I don't want no note, Lord, so you got to pay this thing off. Seven years later, the house was paid in full. I don't tell me what God mm -hmm. can do. Man, let me tell you something. God will do, let me tell you, God will only bless you beyond, he can never bless us beyond our miracle capacity. God can never bless you beyond what you can believe for. If you can't believe for a new car, you better trust for old. Okay. Amen. <laughs> you can't believe for a buy a house, then you better believe the rent one. Praise God. Okay. God will bless you where you are. Mm. And your faith is determined based on the level of word you get into. See, the problem with us is we don't want to get in the word. You want Cadillac faith. Uh -huh. You know, you want Cadillac faith. But, but you're spending it. time with Volkswagen. Yeah, you spend Volkswagen time with them. You can't drive Cadillac when you're spending Volkswagen time. No, no, you want full-time benefit, but work part-time. It don't work like that. You're going to see a little man on your chair, sleeping on the sofa. I done ran out of time. I might be out of time, but I'm not out of revelation. God bless you. God keep you. My name is Gregory Baptiste from Behold the Lamb International. We're changing lives. One laugh at a time. If you want to sow into this ministry, we're set up with Givelify. We're also set up with uh, Cash App, Dollar Sign, Behold the Lamb Church. Everything you sow into this ministry will be used to touch lives all around this world. And let me just get a shout out to all the believers at Behold the Lamb that showed up and showed out for the young lady who uh, got baptized and in the little shower that we gave just to show the love of God. I thank all of you for your commitment. I told my wife the other day, I said, man, this is the best church on this side of heaven. Praise God. If you don't know the Lord and the pardon of your sin, would you, I'd like to pray. Would you, would you pray with me? Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ died and went to hell, so I would have it. I know I'm not where I ought to be, but I'm not where I used to be. Lord, bring me to the place where I can grow in grace and knowledge of the truth. Give me a hunger for your word. And Lord, let me get on your word so that your word can get in me. Lord Jesus, come to my heart. Be my personal savior. I'll follow you. I'll serve you all the days of my life. Plant me in a good church, Bible teaching church, where that I can grow up and begin to work the work of the ministry. Thank you, Lord, that I have not been born in vain, but on purpose. And I know that purpose is the original intent of me. Lord, let me fulfill my purpose while I'm here. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God keep you.